Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast brought to you by BetMGM. I'm your host, Mike Calabrese, joined by Greg Waddell. It's a two-man team this week, just for this Monday episode while Stucky is on vacation. But we're still going to give you the full rundown of the weekend, our best bets for Monday, Tuesday, a little bubble talk, and we're going to throw out some trivia. If you're listening out there in podcast land, there's two ways to win this week. It's not just Greg who gets to play. We're going to throw up a trivia question at Action Podcasts. That's plural, Action Podcasts over on Twitter, on X, at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today on Monday, February 19th. First person to answer correctly gets some kind of prize pack. Matt Mitchell will decide something Action Network related. Also, second way to win, if you go ahead and you respond in the Apple reviews, give us a five-star review, say something nice about the show, and provide the correct answer to the trivia question, the first person who gets that right will get a $10 free parlay from me. Any parlay that you want, I'll throw it together. And uh, just hit me up over on Twitter, at East Breeze. That's E-A-S-T-B-R-E-E-S-E. All right, enough, enough housekeeping here, Greg. What did you think of the weekends? There was a big old turd for a top five matchup. I believe it was the largest top five blowout between conference opponents in... I'm going to say NCAA history. I think that got thrown around. Whatever it was, it was a disaster for Shaka Smart and Marquette. They got totally outclassed. We mentioned it on the Saturday show that UConn was elite defending the rim. Even so, like Marquette could not make a shot inside of five feet. They got so many decent looks in the second half just when they were on the cusp of maybe cutting it to 12 or 15 and they couldn't couldn't make it. So what were your thoughts on the Eagles and the Huskies? Yeah, I think the largest takeaway from the entire weekend has to be that there's some separation at the top and it's UConn. It, it, it's not UConn and Purdue. And it's easy to say that after Purdue's loss to Ohio state and Jake Diebler in his head coaching debut. But I think we would be saying it even had Purdue survived that game and, and won a single digit ball game. Like the eye test alone, I feel like I'm watching a team in a completely different league than the rest of college basketball. Every time I've watched UConn in the last two months, because they won this game by 28 points. I don't feel like they played particularly great. They shot 36% from three. Nobody scored like 20 points in this game. It's kind of just the sum of their parts. And that's sort of how they won the championship last year. I remember watching them at the final four last year thinking, man, there's five stars on the floor at all times. And they're so unselfish and they defend, they shoot and they never take bad shots. And that's this year's team too. I mean, Cam Spencer, has opened things up for them massively. But you look up and down this roster, it's not like there is a bona fide NBA talent on this team. Klingon's going to get picked early. Castle will get a chance. But this is just a really, really good basketball team with seven to eight really, really good college basketball players, an elite coach, and you're going to have to play your A-plus effort just to keep it close against UConn. And that's certainly not what we got from Tyler Kolick. I think we got his F effort in this game, which is becoming a consistent theme against some of the best teams Marquette has played this year. Yeah, it seems kind of like a, a mushy da- data point when you talk about motivation and energy. But it would be easy for UConn to just kind of coast in some games like that. But you saw how fired up they were. They look more like a team that's been on the cusp, that's been to the Final Four a few times and flamed out, that just want to finish the job. Not a defending champion that everyone's patting on the back. So I understand that that can be hard to quantify to a certain degree, but they certainly play with passion. You mentioned Cam Spencer. Every time that they were hitting a big run, going on a 10-0 run, getting a huge defensive stop, he was throwing his hands up in the air, firing the crowd up. Like Every single time Marquette, was calling a timeout and trying to regroup. It just looked like UConn was getting stronger. And in terms of, you know, putting your you know, money behind one team, one one seed to at least get to the final four, I agree with you. At this point, it's UConn and nobody else. There's nobody else in that class whatsoever. Purdue, you know, losing to an Ohio State team that was beyond floundering, that says to me, like, are they going to be a victim in the, the first weekend again? So all of a sudden, I think it's – exactly how you put it, which is the big time separation between UConn and everybody else. All right. I teased it at the top. I'm going to hit you with a bunch of trivia questions throughout the episode. So we're going to start with this one. 11, 15 seeds have won at least one NCAA tournament game. Can you name seven of them? Oh my God. Let's give this a shot. Um, Middle Tennessee. That's correct. Over Michigan State. Not shocked that you went there first. Yeah, shout out Giddy Potts. Um, 
I think Florida Gulf Coast was a 15. That's correct. They also went to the Sweet 16. I think Oral Roberts was a 15. Oral Bob, there you go. Three for three. I think Lehigh was a 15 against there Duke. That's correct. 2012. Mm, this is where it's going to get tough on me. I feel like there's. I, other... I'm going to give you a little clue here. You mentioned Lehigh in 2012. That very night, another 15 seed won as well. So it had been an 11 year stretch from 01 to 2012 without an upset, 15 over two. And then they got two within about a four and a half hour window. Oh, this was okay. Was that Missouri? Missouri was upset by Kyle O'Quinn and Norfolk State. Yeah, that's correct. There yes. we go. All right, you just need okay. two more to uh, to cash this this question here. Uh well, we had last year we had Arizona losing to Princeton. Correct. And there was one other recent one. It must. Oh, St. Peter's Peacock. Correct. Yes, St. Pete's the only one to make it to the Sweet Sixteen and win, going all the way to the Elite Eight. So you got seven on seven guesses. Don't uh, make do me think... get eight. Help okay. I'm, not, I'm not getting more than eight. All right. The only ones that you missed, uh, the four before that, 1991, the very first team to do it, the Richmond Spiders. Then 93, the Steve Nash-led Santa Clara Broncos. 1997, Coppin State. And 2001, Iowa State, Marcus Pfizer going down to Hampton. So those are your 11, 15 seeds to win at least one NCAA tournament game. Four have made the Sweet 16, Florida Gulf Coast, Oral Roberts, St. Peter's, and Princeton. We've now had it three years in a row. We'll see if we get it to four years in a row. All right, let's transition now to a bubble segment, which I'm excited about. This is about the time of year when everyone starts digging in, debating resumes, debating quad one wins, quad two. Is it better to have top end wins or avoid some of those really ugly losses. It feels like the committee kind of picks and chooses which criteria they find to be most important. I threw out six in the Slack channel. You grabbed three teams. I took the other three. So why don't we get started with not only a team that you feel is on the bubble that will make it on selection Sunday, but could actually make some noise in that, you know, 10, 11, 12 range. Yeah. I jumped quickly on the three that I believe in the most that we were going back and forth on here. So I'm going to end up making positive cases for all three of these teams, but the one that I believe in at the very top of my list of three would be Gonzaga. Look, I know it's been an up and down season. I argued against this Gonzaga team as little as a week and a half ago on this very program. The reality is this team is 20th on Ken Palm right now. Anytime you get a team that the analytics say is that high caliber that is considered a bubble team is not a team that a, a middle of the pack seeded team is going to want to see in the NCAA tournament. Um, as long as they get in, it's a brand new season. And I think that's important because Gonzaga doesn't get a ton of huge opportunities over there in the West Coast Conference. The good news for them is they have their two biggest opportunities of the season to end the year. They go at San Francisco, at St. Mary's in the final two games of the season. Um, I think because of what they did at Rupp Arena, because that win looks better and better with Kentucky going to Auburn and destroying them, I think Gonzaga has now become a serious legitimate option as uh, an at-large team and not in a spot where they just need to win the West Coast Conference Tournament. So you've got to get it at minimum one of those final two. I think Gonzaga is capable of getting both of those final two. And at the end of the day, they're going to go to the Mark Few Invitational, a.k.a. the West Coast Conference Tournament. He has won this 19 times in 24 seasons as a head coach of the Zags. Um, I still have questions personnel-wise. I don't love their top-end talent. I'm not the biggest Ryan Nemhard guy, but the numbers are the numbers, man. A top-20 team on Ken Palm that we're acting like is very bubbly, I don't think that's going to last much longer. All right, direct question for their at-large hopes. Let's say they split that, uh, those last two games that you mentioned in the regular season, San Fran and St. Mary's. Do you think they're in if they just make it to the WCC final? If Or maybe even less than that. Say they lose in the semis to San Francisco. Does that doom them? Do they need to at least make it to the title game? Where do you view that? In my head, which I am no bracketologist, I just talk to bracketologists. In my head... I think the only scenario where they would not get in if they split and they lose in the title game would be if they get swept by St. Mary's. Remember, they lost okay. the first one at, at uh, 
uh, at home. <clears throat> so if they lose at St. Mary's, beat San Francisco, and then get St. Mary's a third time in the West Coast Conference title game, 0-3 I think would be a pretty big black mark on the resume. But as long as they get one of two final games against St. Mary's uh, somewhere along the way, I think they could lose in the title game of the tournament and be fine. All right, I'll stump for my first bubble team here. Colorado, as Stucky has pointed out on multiple occasions, three high-end starters, all with first-round NBA draft grades. K.J. Simpson is nearly a 25-5 and five guy, shooting almost 45% from three. Tristan De Silva is over 15 points per game. Cody Williams, as, as a freshman, has been dynamic at times. It's a big team. They're 14th nationally in team height. They're 41st in fast break points. And I love what they can do in terms of shooting the basketball it finally paid off. They they woke up from a sleepy start against USC. They end up splitting those games in LA, losing to UCLA, beating USC, I think in double overtime. But in general, I view this team as one that has a very high ceiling because of their shooting prowess. They're fifth in shooting percentage from the floor, eighth from three-point range, ninth from the line. That really should matter when it comes to March Madness. Like a lot of these teams, you can see struggle when they get into half court battles. They can score in a lot of different ways. Yes, they like to push the pace and score in transition, but they can make shots. They have lots of shooters on this team. They're a bit of a mystery still from a resume perspective because what's their best win in the non-conference? Richmond by five on a neutral floor. And as Richmond kind of falls back in the A-10 race, that doesn't look quite as strong as it once did. They're also really strong in the defensive glass. I like that as well. I like Tad Boyle as a coach. He has eight winning seasons in Pac-12 play in, in his 13 years in Boulder. So he's he's always been somebody, in my opinion, who's been a little bit above average in the, in the Pac-12. I'm hoping that they can string together some wins so it doesn't become a you got to go to at least the semis situation. But I think that's where they are right now. You got to make it to the semis in Las Vegas to the Pac-12 tournament. And preferably you go to the title game. If they run into Arizona and get absolutely flushed again, kind of the the point that you were making with the Zags, where it's like if they run into the same St. Mary's team and get embarrassed, I think it's easier for the committee to be like, this was your opportunity. You could have at the very least put a really good game on film. You didn't do it. Um, but if Colorado can avoid Arizona, which it seems to have been their kryptonite this season, I think that they're going to punch their ticket and they would be a very dangerous team if they were in that play in 11, 11 game to get that kind of, springboard into the NCAA tournament. I could see them going on a run. It's been a launching pad for many teams. All right. Who else do you like? On the bubble? I got a Colorado okay. question for you real quick. So here, here's my fear with the buffs. I feel like you could almost cut their season in half. They had all these injury concerns. They were missing two of the three stars for a very long time. And you're thinking, Oh, they're going to get all these guys back. They're going to clearly emerge as the second best team in the pac 12. They've lost four of six with everybody healthy. Like, I feel like they got the stars back and somehow this team eye test wise looks worse than they did when they were struggling without them. What do you make of that whole ordeal? I think there, there's some chemistry continuity issues for sure. I also just think, you know, this happens a little bit more in football where it can be demoralizing when you get physically beat up and get, get dump trucked and lose by 40 points. That Arizona loss, I think, was really hanging over their head. The UCLA loss isn't so bad on the road. They still played a pretty decent game. It was going to be five alarm fire time if they lost to USC. I think that's kind of a moment that maybe can be a rallying point for the rest of their season and say like the chips were down. We had to win that game on the road. We did it. And that's kind of my issue. My main issue with Colorado, which is if they played the whole tournament in Boulder, they would probably be, you know, I would argue one of the 20 teams in the whole country who could win it. You can say that about a bunch of teams out West. New Mexico is another one if they got to play at the pit. But Colorado's not done such great work on the road. So any win by any means necessary, I'm looking at it as a positive. But I really want to see them build some momentum going into the Pac-12 tournament, particularly on the road. And I also don't think it helps the way that the schedule works in the Pac-12 with the back-to-backs. You know, you do two road games in one week. In a lot of cases, you know, that has bit some teams that are actually pretty good. Not every conference does it like that. Sometimes they break those up. You know, you don't have those, you know, where you're going to the Pacific Northwest for a, a four day weekend, pretty much. So these are kind of mini excuses for them. I still need to see them put it together. But in terms of potential high ceiling, we're talking about flawed teams in general. So I, I do think Colorado, if the chemistry and continuity can get going a little bit, they have a much higher ceiling than a lot of teams on this list. That's fair. That's very fair. All right, I'll go to my next one here. Uh, I'm going to move to my Big Ten country. I'm looking at the Corn Huskers. So Nebraska is basically just unstoppable at home and can't buy a win on the road. In Big Ten play, they're 8-0 undefeated 
at home. They're 0-7, haven't gotten a win on the road. I mean, that's as clean as you can cut it. With that said, I think there's been a little bit of bad luck involved here, and I don't like using the L word when it comes to tournament resumes because you make your own luck. I strongly believe that, but... Nebraska lost in overtime at the rack against Rutgers. They lost in overtime in Champaign to Illinois. They very easily could have won either of those games. If they had won just one of them, we're looking at this resume completely differently. Uh, I love looking for teams that have good balance offensively and defensively. There's all the numbers that you can almost identify who the national champion is going to be based on who has a top 25 offense, who has a top 25 defense. Well, Nebraska is one spot away from having a top 50 offense in defense, and that's rare for teams that are firmly on the bubble. Normally, you're looking uh, – sometimes teams aren't even in the top 50 in either, but if you're good at one thing, you're usually very bad at the other. Nebraska's not. They're pretty solid on both ends. They shoot the ball well. They shoot a ton of threes. They have an offensive star in Kisei Tominaga who can be that March darling. It would be a shame if we don't get to see him in the NCAA tournament. And really, they have some very good wins that I think are going to stand up against other resumes when we get to Team A versus Team B time. There's not going to be any bubble teams with a win over Purdue, let alone a blowout win over Purdue. I mean, this isn't Ohio State winning in the final possession. This isn't Boo Booey's final minute heroics. This is we were up 18 on Purdue for much of the second half. Uh, I think this team's going to find a way into the tournament. The schedule opens up a bit down the stretch. And I think just point blank, they're good enough that they will get their way in. I pretty much agree with you. I, I don't have a, a lot to say other than they got to prove it on the road. But this has been one of those years where nobody's winning on the road. Even top 10 teams, it's just been a, a moment to either melt in the spot, not show up at all, losing to unranked teams. So anybody who can show me consistency on the road, even as you pointed out, you don't always have to win the games. Like just be competitive and not get run off the floor because at this point, I think that a lot of teams are going to be exposed in the, you know, three, four, five seed line that have built a really solid resume throughout the year, but winning on their home court. You mentioned Auburn as well. You don't get to play in the jungle. So let's see how these teams look on neutral floors away from home. I mentioned the SEC. I'm going to stick there. How about Ole Miss? They got some decent wins, not great wins. NC State, Memphis, Florida, Texas A&M. All of these, I'm like, you know, I'm nodding my head. I'm, I'm starting to, to feel like I have a, a handle on what their ceiling is. They have three guards who can really score, and Merle, Flanagan, and Murray. As a group from their backcourt, they average almost 47 a night. They're 22nd in Ken Palm team experience as well, which I certainly like. They have a disruptive defense. They force over 13 turnovers a game, and they block six shots per game, which is six nationally. They can catch fire from three, which gives them a higher ceiling in terms of their variance. They shoot almost 39% from long range. That's 10th nationally. But critically, I get Chris Beard. In his last four NCAA tournament trips, he's 10-4 and four straight up. And he did it, you know, made water out of wine at Little Rock, at Texas Tech, taking Texas Tech to the national title game in a game they probably should have won. You know, if they play that 100 times, I think they're in that 40 to 50 range of winning those games. The fact of the matter is he's a phenomenal coach, all personal issues aside, and I got him now. And he's done really well early in his career at Little Rock, at, you know, at Texas Tech. So I view this as getting a great coach with a team that has the scoring from the backcourt to get it done. I just need one marquee win. But to, to your point kind of earlier, if they had a marquee win, they wouldn't be on the bubble. So I think you're getting a discount on a team like Ole Miss. I'm hoping that it comes together for them and builds a little confidence in Nashville next month. Maybe they get a win over an Alabama, an Auburn, a Kentucky, a Tennessee, because I think that's the, the final piece of the puzzle here where they can really start to buy in and believe. But in terms of their, their overall resume, their chemistry, their DNA, I think they have it. And I'm a big believer in coaches in the tournament. Um, you know, there's, there's some people who say like, oh, these coaches are due. You know, they've had early. I do not like that. I do not want to buy into a coach for the very first time getting to the second weekend and Chris Beard's experienced. So I'm going to go with him. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on on Chris. And I uh, I mean, it feels icky to say it just given all the personal stuff. But I think he's the kind of forgotten name with all these jobs that are about to come open. Like it, it, Louisville's going to come open. We think Mick Cronin wants out. UCLA could come open. There's not a better basketball coach that a blue blood could hire than Chris Beard. There just isn't. And you need to make that decision for yourself, whoever you are as an athletic director. But uh, I, I just think people have wanted to stop talking about it. And I'm glad that we're acknowledging it because he is 
basically a top five coach in the sport. Um, I also think for their schedule down the stretch, I really like the opportunities that present themselves because you mentioned they need some marquee wins. Their final three home games are all against teams currently projected in the field, South Carolina, Alabama, and Texas A&M. The thing about those three home games is two of them come against teams that I think Ole Miss might just be better than. I know we've talked a lot about South Carolina, but this last week was really bad for Lamont Paris. Texas A&M, Ole Miss already beat head-to-head on the road, and they might be able to sweep them. Uh, If they can take care of business in two of those three, I think they're going to be firmly in. So I really like that call. Uh, My last one here. Sorry, real quick before you get to it. I just wanted to get your opinion on the Rick Pitino commentary. I don't know if you saw all of it over the weekend. For those listening who didn't catch it, his team melted in a huge way against Seton Hall. And to say that he didn't mince his words or hold anything back would be a massive understatement. He basically said, I knew when I looked at this roster preseason, this was going to be a rough year. We're slow, but he didn't even stop there. He went through individual players, some starters like Soriano, who's been the backbone of the team for two years, and just said, oh, he's got no lateral quickness. He stinks, more or less. He flamethrowed his team. It was rough to listen to. I don't understand how that benefits him on the recruiting trail to a certain degree. I've seen it a little bit in college football where you're trying to set expectations maybe in the preseason, but just throwing his whole team under the bus, stopping, backing up, running them over again. It was pretty wild. I know that he's frustrated, but like, you know, he's coached a thousand games. Like you have to imagine at some point he was frustrated like this, but he just went off on the Johnnies. Yeah, there's plenty of receipts from him in the offseason, too, before you had seen this team play a game of praising how great his staff did in bringing these players in and his team's athleticism and the very pointed things that he said they have known since the summer that this team doesn't have. Um, It's a bad look, and I struggle because I don't like sitting here as a quote-unquote media member or whatever you want to call us in this space criticizing coaches for giving non-coach speak answers. I want more of that. I want coaches to come up and be honest and share colorful answers and give personality. I would draw the line at calling out individual players and their weaknesses. All that's going to result in for Patino here is a bunch of players looking to leave this program, get in the portal. I don't know why players would necessarily want to go play for a coach who is disappointed in their criticism of your limitations, but he's a legend. And some players do respect it. He's clearly looking for the tough-nosed kids that can handle it. But, uh, like, he built this roster. He was the GM of this roster. He's the reason for it failing. And uh, to throw it all in the players is a little bit. He he also threw St. John's facilities under the bus, which they deserve it. The facilities are trash. They're working on fixing it. But in general, I think coaches, the, the rule of thumb is you can call out someone's effort. You can call out their intensity and call out some of the intangibles, the leadership, you know, re, re, you know, needing more from his senior leaders on the team. But calling someone slow doesn't fix anything. It's not like all of a sudden, oh, I, I'll run faster or, you know, I'll be able to slide defensively faster. Like, they are what they are. So it was kind of surprising to me. All right. Back to the bubble talk. Our last teams. You go first. My last one, I'm going to the Mountain West here, and I like Nevada. I have enjoyed watching this team all season long. I I think most of us here at Action Network are Mountain West truthers this year. Like, we want to see six teams get in from this league in the NCAA tournament. I think if they do get those six teams in the tournament, it's likely that this conference makes more noise than a Pac-12 or a Big Ten or even an ACC Uh, They're legitimately good, and the bottom of the Mountain West is not, but if we're just cutting the line at six, they have six teams that are better than most power conferences, six best teams. Nevada is one of them. They've been stellar over the course of the season. They have a superstar in Keenan Blackshear who I just love. I think he's your prototypical March Madness NCAA tournament guard that gets hot and makes a run. Uh, his numbers on the season are pretty ridiculous. Uh, he's like a 16-5-5 a, a five and five guy on 50% from the floor. You don't find that really anywhere at this point. And they've got great wins. You go back to the beginning of the season long before league play started, uh, you've got win at Washington, TCU on a neutral I'm really impressed with the resume they've put together. They just need to avoid some bad losses here down the stretch. But the one other thing I would just add that gives me hope that not only do they make the tournament, maybe they have some noise once they get there. Uh, I've always circled this mentally and called it the Mitch McGarry experience. And I don't mean like falling in love with smoking weed and bowling professionally. I mean, 
you go from just a role player to like a superstar and it, the transition happens almost overnight. That's what's going on with Nick Davidson, who is a sophomore big for Nevada right now. He's gone from a perfectly fine, good center that you believe in the ceiling of long term to his last five games. He's averaging 20 points, nine rebounds and two assists. He's been unguardable. And if they get that from him on an every game basis alongside Blackshear, I mean, there's not top 10 teams in the country that have a better duo at the top of the roster than that. Yeah, we are a Mountain West truthers here at Action. I agree with you. I think they'll end up getting five. I, I'm not quite sure what we need to be rooting for in the conference tournament, but whatever it takes to get six would be phenomenal. Some of these also rans in the quote-unquote power conferences. I, I don't want those ACC bubble teams. I don't want most of the Big Ten bubble teams. Like Unless they show me something strong down the stretch, I would much rather have the cream of the crop in the Mountain West. All right, last team for me out of the Big East. I'll go Providence. I think people just wrote them off when they lost Hopkins. They're like, you know, they don't have enough to get it done. It starts with Devin Carter. He's been more than enough. He's closing in on 20 points per game, eight rebounds and three and a half assists on 40% shooting from three-point range. You got yourself a superstar. But it's not just him anymore. Josh Adoro is really coming on lately. Past six games, he's averaging almost 25 per game and eight rebounds. He plays like that. They're going to be a real threat to win the Big East tournament at MSG. And, you know, beyond punching an automatic ticket in, in that case, if they get in as a 10 or 11 seed, I think they're dangerous. They've shown, you know, I understand that some of these wins were with Hopkins, but they beat Wisconsin Marquette, the America's Dairyland two-step. Then <laughs> even without Hopkins, they knocked off Creighton and they kept it competitive against UConn at Gamble. They were down five or six in the closing minutes. I think they lost that by nine. But UConn's been slashing throats in the Big East for the past month. So I view that as a positive sign. They're a strong defensive team. They're 27th in opponent shooting efficiency allowed, 25th in defensive boards per game. I just think that this team, because of the coaching change in the offseason and then losing Hopkins, people are like, okay, th this team is going to be you know, someone you could circle maybe in 2025. We'll get back to them. I think people are skipping by Kim English's squad. And like I said, if Oduro plays the way that he's been playing, they have two legitimate stars on this team, and that is enough to go on a run in March Madness. So I actually like where the Friars are. They, they still have plenty of work to do to strengthen their resume, but if they get in, I like them. Yeah, if they get in, they're going to have earned it because down the stretch here, they do have some very tough games. I mean, on the road to Marquette, uh, to Xavier. Xavier's not playing well right now, but still not an easy place to get a win. And then you end the season at home against UConn. Who knows what motivation is going to be there for UConn at that point. But um, they're going to pick up resume wins by default if they do get in because they're going to have some work to do. The only thing I would say with, with Providence and with Big East teams in general for me this year, um, I, I almost think you have to isolate their conference season performance by removing their games against Georgetown and DePaul. No disrespect to those teams, but they have one win combined in conference play between them. Like if you're not beating those teams every time you play them, there's something seriously wrong with you. Providence is five and seven against league opponents that are not those teams. Uh, they still have one more upcoming against Georgetown, by the way. So I think the conference record is going to look okay. It's just much more like, are any of these substantial? And they did get the Creighton win at home. That That's a big one for sure. Like I said, down the stretch, some very difficult games coming up. They will earn it if they end up getting there. All right, before we get into our board for Monday and Tuesday, our card, I should say, I'm going to hit you with two trivia questions it's interesting, the NBA, you got to have two guys if you get to the NBA Finals that can go for 30-plus in a single game. Like, that's kind of the, the floor, the bare minimum. It can't just be a single superstar carrying the load. But college basketball is different. I, I don't need to belabor that point. You can play team basketball. You can, you know, have a, a leader on the floor that's not necessarily a go-to scorer. You saw it with Anthony Davis in Kentucky, you know, about 12 years ago where he was doing it with rebounds and blocks and who score 12 to 14 points per game, they're still dominant. So here's the question. Who was the last national champion to feature a 20-point-plus-per-game scorer? Ooh. Looking through, I, I try always when I come up with questions like this to answer it myself, and my first two guesses, they were in like the 18 or 19-point-per-game range. They didn't quite get there. Hmm. I love this question. My strong suspicion is you're going to have to go back a little bit here. I think you're you're on the right path thus far as you talk it through. All right, there's one that's just screaming in my head. Uh, 
I, the more I talk it through, though, I think it's probably the 18 to 19 point range. I'm going to trust the gut. Is it Carmelo Anthony Syracuse? You don't have to go that far back. So it has been more recent than that. Hmm. Are we talking tens? Can I get more hints here? How's this working? <laughs> uh, let's see. I would say my advice is when you think about this team, it's not necessarily a super elite offensive squad. So that's going to rule out, say, like a Baylor team that won, you know, during that COVID comeback year where they were top five in terms of offensive efficiency. They spread it out a little bit. They had, you know, multiple scorers. So it was really a one man show. And that's that's my clue there. Mm. One man show makes me think the UConn teams could be Kemba, could be Shabazz. Is it either of those? Kemba Walker is correct. Not only did he go for over 20, 23 and a half points per game in the 2011 season. And to check in on your Carmelo Anthony guests, he averaged 22.2 points per game during his one season up in Western New York or Central New York. Um, so Calbreece, right. that's a that's a bad miss. That's a kick to the corner. I'm wide open. I'm a 44 percent shooter and I just clanked it. That's what happened there. You give me Kemba Walker on a tee and I can't hit it out of the park. Brutal. All right. Th this one will make you feel a little bit better. Since 2000, which three conferences have produced the most final four participants? <laughs> the Big Ten is one. I know this. Big Ten is number two on the list with 16 bids since the year 2000. Da, 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 da. Just making sure I'm going through the obvious ones here. I would think it's the Big 12 and the uh, SEC. Could be the Big East. Could be the ACC. Duke and Carolina are always good. Don't forget about the Ivy League. There's lots of conferences don't, out there. Don't, don't forget the Ivy League. Don't forget the Mountain West. Oh, boy. Okay. I think... Uh, I mean the big the big east was like champions but I don't feel like they've had a lot of final four participants outside of that. I mean the Villanova, Yukon they've had a bunch. I'm going to lock in the ACC first and trust that Duke's gotten there enough. ACC number 1 since the year 2000 with 18. So you got 1 and 2, ACC with 18 bids, Big 10 with 16, and this third conference has sent 14 teams the final four since 2000 since 2000 well kansas has probably gotten there like seven times themselves this is basically kansas versus the big east for me or i, I mean kentucky sec ah calabrese i'm gonna go i'm gonna trust my gut and go with the big 12 big 12 is number four on the list with 12 oh. teams the big east with Damn 14 it. appearances in the final floor. All right, we'll save the last trivia question for after the Monday slate. I'm going to get it started. Game that I can't wait to watch. I'm going to have action on it, but also in general, I just, you know, I'd watch it for free. Iowa State traveling down to H Town. Houston laying nine and a half, the total 127 and a half. For starters, I like a player prop. I'm going to butcher this guy's name. I'm going to try my best. Mom Chilovich. All right. Mom Chilovich over eight and a half points. The last time they played, he had 11 just on eight points or eight shot attempts from the field. They're going to need him to put up some threes. I think he's going to shoot at least four or five threes in this game. He's gone over eight and a half points, which is where it's sitting in the market right now in 13 of his last 16 games. As a freshman, I understand it can be scary against a Houston defense that is incredible, but I think they just need him. They, they can't keep pace in this game without him probably going for double digits so i i like this one a lot i'm gonna go with him over i also like a uh, little parlay here i think houston asserts their dominance as the best team in the big 12 arguably the best team outside of uconn in the entire country i'm gonna lay the points and in some cases when you do these same game parlays when you have the tighter windows they'll give you a little bit more uh, on the payout i'm also going to go under 127 and a half a lot of people would view that as there's not much wiggle room. There's not many outs. I agree. But their last meeting, it was 57-53 at Hilton, an upset for Iowa State. You look at the defenses. Ken Palm D, Houston, first by a long shot. Iowa State, third. Then you look at raw tempo numbers. Houston slows it way down. 349th in the country. Iowa State, 
by no means are Jackrabbits there, 156th in raw tempo. The calling cards for these Ds, Houston's defense shuts you down to the three-point arc, eighth in percentage allowed there. And Iowa State turns you over, turns you over, turns you over. Almost 18 turnovers per game, second in terms of turnover percentage in the entire country. And since the Kansas debacle, Houston has been just clamping teams. 63 points, 62 points, 61 points. And the final piece here in terms of trying to cover the number and also go under the total, Evan Maya are, you know, really an analytic savior coming out of nowhere in the last three or four years, offering all these new pieces of information. His kill shot data. When you look at uh, Houston, not only are they one of the top teams in terms of the 10-0 runs for the entire country, 25 of their 29 10-0 runs have come at home. That's 1.67 kill shots per game at home, by far the best number in the country. So when their defense is getting stops, they're scoring on the other end and basically ending games, removing the opponent's will to live. I like Houston. I like under. I'm going to parlay it together. What are your thoughts on the Cougs and the Cyclones? Well, first off, you're getting some sauce on that little parlay there, especially if you went like same game parlay style with uh with Milan. I mean, that's a lot of conflicting pieces there. If you nail this, I'm liking the odds there. I'm uh I'm gonna fight you here. I'm gonna go to war for my Cyclones. I am adopting this team. I've done it the last couple of weeks on the show, and I'm sticking with them. I simply think this team is top five caliber in the country. I think they're that good, and I don't think Vegas or anyone has realized it yet. Nine and a half in a game between two teams that I would put in the top five in the country is just too many points no matter where it's being played. Uh, This team has covered five straight games. They've covered seven of their last eight. They've covered nine of the last 11. I know it got dicey down the stretch over the weekend, but uh, they found a way. I think it's because they're mispriced. I really do. I think that's that's the only explanation for this. Uh, Houston, on the other hand, I think is a little bit mispriced the opposite way. They've covered just one of their last five. I have some serious questions with who this team is. I know that the Ken Palm and all the sites love them. Uh, actually, speaking of Evan Mia, he's been one of the only metrics gurus this year that has not had Houston with some separation atop the other elite teams in the country. Um They have really beat up on a lot of teams in the middle to lower half of the Big 12. They still do not have a win against Baylor. They do not have a win against Kansas. They do not have a win against Iowa State. They have a lot of wins against the Kansas States and the Cincinnati's and the BYU's, and that's fine. Uh, I just think this is not a team I would expect to blow out anyone right now. There's two key statistics uh, that I think play into Iowa State's favor here as well in keeping this game close. Number one, Iowa State gets to the line a ton. They're 58th in free throw rate in the country. Houston fouls a ton. That's part of the physicality game plan they have defensively. 322nd in foul rate. Uh, if it, if Iowa State gets to the line, shoots a bunch of free throws in this game with the guards they have, I think they have a really good chance to keep this close. That's three points. And then secondly, Houston's two-point offense has not been a strong suit. They're, they grade out really well across the board offensively, but they're just 269th in two-point percentage. They don't have a crazy post threat that they're trying to get 20 points a game from. And Iowa State doesn't give up anything easy. You mentioned how good their defense is, how, ma- how many turnovers they force. They're 37th in the country in two-point percentage defense. If Houston's not generating easy shots at the rim in this game, if they're putting Iowa State on the line, I think 9.5 is a really, really large number. I'm going to back my Cyclones. All right, it's decided then. I think we have a, a home field apparel bet. You can Let's have an, an Iowa State shirt of your choosing. I got my eyes on a five slam a jamma Houston shirt if they can cover this nine and a half. So you can take the points. We'll find out what happens in Houston here. All right. Do I get a do I get a schmedium in uh in honor of TJ Otzelberger? Right? It's gotta be like you, a schmedium. It has to be a schmedium. And you're gonna have to wear it on, on the pod just so everyone can see how beefed up you are. All right. Any other plays on Monday? Or are you are already looking at the Tuesday card? I'm looking at the Tuesday card. I've just got one more play on the early side of the week right now. And uh it's back to Big Ten country. Surprise, surprise. I'm backing the Terps, Maryland plus seven on the road at the Cole Center against Wisconsin. Uh, Look, Maryland, not a good basketball team. That's obvious at this point. They just haven't done what they've needed to do to put themselves in serious NCAA tournament conversation. With that said, this has been a much better basketball team in conference season than anybody realizes. Every single game they've played has been close. 11 of 12 games in Big Ten play. They've covered seven points. Six of their seven losses in conference play have come by five points or less. I mean, we could snap our fingers and they could have a completely different record in conference season. All these games are coming down to the wire. On the other side, Wisconsin, 
I, I don't know that there's a team in the country underperforming to what the metrics say they are more than the Badgers right now. They have covered the spread one time in their last 10 games. They've lost five of the last six outright. And Ken Palm still tells me they're the 19th best team in the country. My eyes tell me otherwise. I think this team has some very serious issues. I've joked about them having NIT DNA the last couple of weeks. Let's not forget, this team returned everybody from a team that underachieved and made the NIT. And when they were as close to the one line as they could be three weeks ago, since then they've snapped their fingers and their season has fallen apart. Uh, I think Maryland is the desperate team here. Wisconsin's out of the Big Ten title race. They're locked into the NCAA tournament, catching seven points, too many points. I'll take the Terps. All right. My pick for Tuesday is number dependent, but Bart Torvik says that San Francisco is catching 10 at St. Mary's. I would take eight. Certainly would love to get 10. Listen, St. Mary's killed them in their first meeting. They won by 17, but USF is on a six-game winning streak. Jonathan Mogbo in that stretch, 16, 10, and four with two and a half stocks per game. He was non-existent in the first meeting, and that was the difference. He cannot disappear. He has to at least get 10 shots up. They have to run the offense through him, and then obviously he's a huge difference maker on the glass and defensively. Since December 1st, the Gales have just been absolutely on one. They have one weird loss. And that was to Missouri State. Other than that, just wins up and down their schedule. Recent matchups with quality WCC teams, a two-point win at Gonzaga and a five-point win at Santa Clara. So they're crushing the also-rans in the West Coast Conference. But when it comes to the, the top of the conference, they're winning these games, but they're not running away with it. And that's why I think if I can get 10, that's way too much. Also, St. Mary's is one of the slowest teams in the in the country. I understand that they beat them by 17 the first time they played, but this is a low-possession game against the San Francisco offense that is highly, highly efficient. They're top 30 in shooting efficiency, ninth and two-point percentage from the field, and a great foul shooting team. So I think that all trends to them keeping this close. They are, you know, arguably the second or third best team in this conference. So I don't think it's a huge stretch for them to give the Gales a, a tough 40 minutes. I'm going to go with the Dons in this spot. All right, we're going to close it up with one more trivia question for you. I'm going to play a little who am I, guess who situation. If you can get it on the first clue, you're a savant. Second clue will be impressed. Third, not so much. And the fourth one, we're going to have to maybe give you some different categories moving forward. All right. Who am I? I am a coach in a major conference, and I am 56 years old. You can throw out one guess. Bad Mata. That is correct. <laughs> All right, I'll give you the rest of the clues. Jesus, Greg. Among okay, actual... no, I, can I explain myself real quick? I did. Yeah. You know, you know this from my conspiracy theories in the Slack channel this week. I've been gassing up that anyone interested in the Ohio State job has just fallen apart and lost all their games in the last week. Uh, that would include Thad Mata, who I did a nice Wikipedia search about. 24 hours ago and was shocked to discover that he's 56 years old. <laughs> I was also shocked. I, I went beyond Wikipedia. I was like, well, that's clearly not correct. I mean, he's got to be like mid sixties. Uh, I'll just give you the rest of the clues. Not that you needed them uh, among active coaches. He has the ninth highest win percentage in the NCAA tournament, making two final fours in one title game. He's been named coach of the year six times in three different conferences, the horizon, the a 10 and the big 10. And my head coaching stops include Butler, Xavier, and Ohio State. All right. Well, that's it for the uh, the two-man episode here on Monday. The three-man weave coming back at you in the next episode. Stucky will be back for the Thursday episode as well, getting into the Saturday live show. We're also going to throw out a special BBOC live episode tomorrow at, uh, I believe, 5 or 5.30. You can check on our social feed when we figure out the exact time for that. But this is the time of year where we're really cranking up the content. We're going to give you analysis from, from Greg, from myself, from Stucky, from Mike Randall, the guys of the three-man weave. So we're going to leave no stone left unturned. This has been the Big Bets on Campus podcast brought to you by BetMGM. A reminder to play our trivia game 3 p.m. on Monday, February 19th over at Action Podcasts, plural with an S. We're going to throw out a question. First person with the correct answer wins something swag bag related from the Action Network. And if you respond and give us a five-star review, say something nice about us, doesn't matter what it is, maybe just the clairvoyance of Greg when it comes to Thad Mata Trivia, throw out a five-star <laughs> review and throw the correct answer to the trivia question that will be listed on Twitter over on X. And you'll win $10 parlay for me personally. I'll book it in here for you in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Happy to do it. 
the fans make the show. We really appreciate everybody listening. For Greg Waddell, I'm Mike Calabrese. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good one.